now with it in big letters. Hey, stop him, somebody. Get out of my way, Jenny. I'm gonna spit. We all know just how and why that man was murdered and who was back with him. Just Pick as you and I. It's marvelous. One man, Johnny Van. With the assassination of JFK in Dallas in November of 1963 and the fall of Cuba to communism, America entered a new chapter in its history. It was also a time when the American mob entered a new chapter. It was a mob no longer defined by the once unyielding code of Omerta, the Sicilian code of silence a mob no longer led by the colorful characters that saw its rise from the Roaring Twenties through the Depression to the Cold War. The American mob began at the turn of the 20th century as immigrants from Europe began pouring into urban centers along the East Coast, particularly New York City. Poor and isolated, these immigrant Jews, Irish, and Italians banded together to develop their own version of the American dream a unique form of business, organized crime. In New York, Lepke, gangster boss of Murder Incorporated, leaves federal jail for Sing Sing's death house. Through newspapers and film, the leaders of organized crime became household names. Chicago's most notorious citizen, Al Capone, often lionized in the mold of true American heroes, the rugged frontier individualists of the past. These names included Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, and Meyer Lansky. This series, Hollywood vs. the Mob, Fact vs. Fiction, will reveal the truth behind the myth of the American mob and its godfathers. In this chilling scene from the Purple Gang, its leader, the leader of the Jewish mafia that controlled Detroit, is about to kill his best friend. I'm gonna leave you alone, Hank. Hollywood was now free to bring a whole new level of violence to the screen. Being trapped in a closet. Look, honey boy, I swear my mother's heart. I was just trying to tip him off to the mafia guys. No, you wanted to go over on their side, Hank. Look, what are you, what are you talking about? Just give me a break. Let me explain. I don't need you, Hank. I don't need you. I can do it all by myself. All by myself, Hank. Oh. oh, my God. No! No, please, just let me explain, honey. Shit. The Purple Gang, released in 1960, veers away from the idea that mobsters were products of their environment, products of urban poverty. Armed with new Jungian and Freudian psychological principles that our actions are controlled by the unconscious mind, Hollywood was eager in the 50s and 60s to retell the mobster stories. Now the anti-heroes are psychotic killers and sociopaths. Chinese coming back. You lying old hag. <laughs> no, no, I'm crazy. Let me go. I know. On a train, huh? Hey, where are you going? No, no. This is why no one is smart. I don't know what to do. 
These mobsters were different than your average poor citizens trying to make a dime to get by. What do you mean? They were cold-blooded killers. Nervous, lying. I'm not lying, Paul, I swear it. You're a bad risk, Tony. A very bad risk. <laughs> Set in Detroit during the Roaring Twenties, in an early scene, the members of the Purple Gang are standing in a lineup. Only these members are different from their real-life counterparts in one major way. In reality, 90% of the Purples were of Jewish descent. But incredibly, none of these characters in the movie are Jewish. Reform school conviction, parole, Instead, these characters were given names like no Smith and no Willard. Problem. Why? Probably because at this time, Hollywood believed America didn't want to see a movie about American Jews, about American Jewish heroes or anti-heroes. A movie about Jewish Jews mobsters them. wouldn't be a commercial success. But a movie about a non-Jewish purple gang would be a hit. All right, thanks. Al Olson, step forward, Al. Al Olson, youngest of the Olson brothers. Known hoodlum, liquor, gambling, rackets, protection. You ever been in the Miraflores Flats, Al? I, uh, was born there. William Joseph Willard. Step forward, Willard. William Joseph Willard, alias Honey Boy Willard. Juvenile conviction, theft, paroled. Turn around, let the audience see your profile. Profile. You've come a long way from Hastings Street, haven't you, Honey Boy? Yeah, Harley. I haven't stopped yet. What became of your old grandparents? They were you should be, Copper. Dead. Send them all out. This one I can hold. Yeah, you try it. My lawyer's in your office now. Your lawyer's tied up in court. Judge Stone called a case of his. I asked him to. Honey Boy, I'm gonna hold you every hour I can. You can't lock me up. Put him in a cell. Throughout the 19th century, Jewish immigrants settled in America's eastern cities and then spread out through the heartland of the Midwest. By 1880, America was home to over 240,000 Jews, and the country had become one of the largest Jewish communities in the world. From 1880 to 1924, the period in American history known as the Mass Migration Era, more than 20 million people from Europe arrived in the United States to start new lives. Two and a half million were Jews. And by 1924, the country had the largest Jewish population in the world. More than four million Jews. By the end of the 19th century, America was changing. Industry was surpassing agriculture as the way to make money. From the outside, America looked like the golden land, a classless society where hard work and effort paid off. As a result, Europe's poor and underprivileged saw the United States as a land of golden opportunity. They came here seeking a change from the old world's stifling class society. From an old world that offered them nothing but the same poverty, intolerance, and demeaning work they had suffered for generations. 
what they found was not so rosy. Cities like New York, Boston, and Chicago were growing by leaps and bounds with little regulation and few services. Poor sanitation, tenement housing, and slums greeted European newcomers. For most of these people, they had traded poor living conditions in Europe for even poorer conditions in America's cities. In spite of these terrible conditions, the new Jewish immigrants, particularly from Eastern Europe and Russia, found themselves in a unique situation that gave them avenues to success. The easiest avenue to power and wealth was crime. For a few Jewish mobsters, it didn't take long for them to get going and form their own gangs. Here we are introduced to the character who will become the leader of the Purple Gang, William Joseph Willard, Honey Boy. Hello, Lieutenant. Honey Boy, you've grown up some since I saw you last. Officer. Please don't remind him of them days. Yeah, he's only a boy. Boys will be boys. He's a good boy now. He's a student. He reads, reads. There's been a lot of robberies lately with a phony protection angle. Robert Blake, who plays Honey Boy, gives a very raw and natural performance. His performance comes out of the school of method acting, the same school of acting Marlon Brando and James Dean studied. I'm not arresting you, Honey Boy, until I have to. Right now, I'm asking you to cooperate. Blake's layered portrayal as a troubled youth can be compared with Brando in The Wild One and Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Son, we only want yeah, to help okay, you. Yeah, okay, Pops. Downstairs. Oh, son. Take care of the girls. Come on out, Hank. Where are you going, Hank? Come on, let me go. I can sneak out the You don't back. have to leave. Stay for a while. Come on. Stay. What, are you scared of something? I don't like to be shut up, you know. So? So I stick around, I guess, huh? Yeah. He's not so smart, Hank. After tonight, Hank, the chips are down. You know what we do? We pick the best men, and we hold them together. You know what makes a gang stick together no matter what? Blue. Yeah, wise guy. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. It's one guy. One guy that they can look up to. See? People are like, like sheep, Hank. They like to follow. Not somebody they respect. No, there's only one thing they respect, Hank. You know what that is? Fear. That's the number that makes the world go round, Hank. That's the number we play. And you know who they fear the most? The guy with the most guts. That's me, Hank. Me with you. Together we got more guts than any of them, huh? Yeah. 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 In reality, the leader of Detroit's Purple Gang was Abe Bernstein, and like the Italian Mafia, it was a family business. Abe and his three brothers, Raymond, Joe, and Izzy, made up the core of what would become the Purple Gang. Like most of the gangs in the United States at this time, the Purple Gang was made up of poor immigrant kids who started out hustling for money on Detroit streets. But the era of bootlegging gave them a chance to enter the big leagues, to become wealthy and powerful. In 1919, America passed the 18th Amendment. Prohibition began a year later. From the beginning, it was a failure. Americans craved their booze, and if they couldn't get it legally, they would get it illegally. Over the 13 years that prohibition was in effect, 
Canada became the biggest supplier of booze for a thirsty America. Detroit, Michigan was the number one port for smuggling illegal booze from Canada into the United States. And the number one gang for bootlegging in Detroit was the Purple Gang. The Purple Gang was the only Jewish gang to run a major city. The Purple Gang supposedly got its name when two shopkeepers, shaken down by the gang for protection money, complained that the gang was rotten. Purple like the color of bad meat. The Purples, as they were called, were particularly known for their ruthlessness against rival gangs. During Prohibition, the gang was linked to over 500 murders in the Detroit area, quickly making Detroit the murder capital of the country. They even branched out and were allegedly behind the infamous St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago. The Bernstein brothers built the Purple Gang into a formidable mafia organization that, in addition to bootlegging, was known for gambling, extortion, and loan sharking. Are violent criminals a product of their environment and can they be rehabilitated? Or is there a correctable psychological element to their behavior that can be fixed? It is this question the film asks over and over. Joe Milford. Sign here. Is it all there? It better be. Well, hurry up and sign. Boy, if you're a juvenile, I'm in my second childhood. You look at copper. <laughs> yeah. That's... Who's from? Welfare bunch got to the juvenile judge. <laughs> All right, lay off, you monkeys. Lay off. There's a meeting in the chief's office, Lieutenant. He's expecting you. A young man, William Joseph Willard, nicknamed Honey Boy. Now, there's a warrant. The social worker believes that Honey Boy is the product of his environment and should be nurtured while Detective Bill Harley, played by Barry Sullivan, takes a simpler point of view. Honey Boy is just plain bad and should be put in jail. Isn't it our duty to aid him, not to brutalize him more? You take this, this spectacle I witnessed last night. Big, burly policeman, manhandling boys. Just a minute, miss. These are not nice little boys being ill-treated by big, bad policemen. They're tough, you understand. They're tough and they're dangerous and they're getting worse. Go easy, Lieutenant. Dr. Reardon here and Miss McNamara are... I know who they are and what they are. I also know the gang of punks we rounded up last night. The Purple Gang. And to them, you don't spout big words out of books. They have grown up without love, without home life, with no real feeling of security. Look, Miss, and you too, Doctor, you've got to start your work in the cradle. When kids turn criminal and start running in gangs, it's too late. And with this bunch you've just turned loose, it's a way too late. They're products of their environment. Aren't we all products of our environment? You say they suffered shock in childhood. They come from broken homes, so do thousands of kids. Yet they manage to grow up and make decent citizens. Look, I, I tell you, Chief, the only solution now is to get tough. I'll get every one of them set free as fast as you arrest them in this manner. Look, Chief, it isn't just penny anti theft with these purples anymore. They're shaking down on the phony protection racket. Every one of them we booked had money. Each one of them could have posted bond. Do you know what that means, miss? It means they're getting money together for a slush fund. Bondsmen, lawyers. It means they're big time. It means you can't stop them with half-baked theories. Are you finished, Lieutenant? Because when you are, I have a report to get out to the Chief. Okay, I'm finished. Look, Chief, take me off this kitty cop detail, will you? Give me anything, bunco, robbery, homicide. Yeah, homicide. That's where I'll run into your nice little friends again, at the end of the road. Only then it'll be murder. They're headed for it. Somebody's doing their thinking for them, and it isn't you. Here is the building where the Purple Gang carried out their operation. 
In the movie, it's a much more grandiose setup. A modest warehouse in the Detroit slums, but a very rich enterprise for the Olsen brothers. but it was highly efficient. Liquor from Canada poured into the sugar house, then out over the United States in an enormous flood. And the Olsen brothers supplied no small part of it. But before it reached the thirsting millions, this rich flow of Canadian whiskey was cut with raw alcohol made directly from sugar. Honeyboy and Hank Smith were being introduced to the big time that day. Very big time. But this particular load of whiskey left the sugar house undiluted. Its destination, Chicago. Al Capone's private stock. It went to him sealed and uncut, right off the boat. Honeyboy's imagination needed no more prodding. He was ready to throw in with the Olsen brothers and ride that flood of liquor towards his wildest dreams of power. The deal was this. The Olsons to supply a business organization, Honeyboy to provide a strong-armed gang young enough to have no caution and brutal enough to do anything. The period of bloodshed and violence was about to begin. In the previous scene, the movie correctly portrays the business side of America's illegal bootlegging operation. How liquor was brought in from Windsor, Canada to Detroit, Michigan. Then cut at a sugar plant and sent out across the United States. This was absolutely true. It was also true that the Purple sent liquor to Al Capone in Chicago. The Purples were so feared for their violence that Capone decided to form a business relationship with them instead of trying to muscle in on Detroit's mafia. Capone knew that any step toward Detroit would lead to a war neither one could afford. Gambling was big business, stakes high and the game's rough. Most of the money easy come from rum runners. Protection of the illegal gambling places was taken over by the Purple Gang. They also cut in on prostitution, and heaven help a poor girl who didn't pay her share to the collectors. And since a lot of them were still kids, they swiped candy, victimized shopkeepers, stuck up grocery stores, and rolled rocks. The carnival of crime extended to newspaper circulation wars. Fights between rival cab companies. Hijacking trucks, destroying produce to force market prices higher. Even the farmer was caught in the middle with organized gangs four city dealers to pay for protection. So I said, any mud, you gotta go. It's either you or me, you old bag. Lieutenant! They ain't even listening. Oh, yeah, Daisy, of course I'm listening. Just like I listened when you confessed to killing your Uncle Joe. This time it's your Aunt Maud. The time before that, it was some guy you just read about in the newspapers. You are a chronic confessor. But I did Look, Daisy, the county has a new department. It's got a doctor. You know, um, head shrinker. Right now, it's naughty little boys he's interested in, but he'll just love you, Daisy. You cops are all alike. Never believe a lady. The Purples were involved with every racket there was. Extortion, hijacking, gambling, narcotics, and they even made quite a name for themselves in the kidnapping business. They were famous for kidnapping rival gang members for ransom. They had become so adept at kidnapping that the FBI had considered them as suspects in the abduction of Charles Lindbergh's baby. What is about to follow is the most horrible event in the movie in any mobster movie ever. Joe? Pretty good looking, huh, Joe? Mm-hmm. I've seen her around here before. 
I'll bet she's got a lot of dough in that purse. Dough? Yeah. Seems like that just asking for trouble coming down here. We have decided that with a little uh, applied psychology with the parents, and all we... Mrs. Kowalski, we, we would like to... Mrs. Kowalski! this rock in her finger. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's my engagement ring. Please don't take it. Look, I can get you all the money you want. You can, huh? Scram. Scram! No! 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 Please Purple gang again. This time at the homicide level. Criminal The social worker, the one who thought that modern psychology would help these kids, is raped and murdered by the very juvenile delinquent she wanted to save. It turns out the youthful purple gang is beyond saving. They are savage. In the film, these mobsters are not glamorized in any way, but are shown as boys and men okay, who boys, would kill women. Until you know your own names. Take them out, all except that one. Okay, let's go. Don't lay a hand on them, George. They're juveniles. Let them set. This one was growing up. Come on. Charge is murder. Joe Milford went up for life, but one conviction doesn't destroy a gang. Liquor running increased in volume and in violence. The Purple Gang became the most notorious in America. Hilson's got what they paid for, and Honey Boy Willard enforced his rules with extreme brutality as his power increased. To come on, Hank. I got the payoff right here, cop. Come on. What are you afraid of? He's got the money. Hey, you see him? He's right there in the alley. Oh, hey, that's it. Here, a cop is shot. Even though the cop was crooked, the fact that the purple shot him shows that they think they are above the law, that they can't be stopped. This murder was based on an actual event. The Detroit police officer, Vivian Welch, had been shaking down various rum running operations and speakeasies. When he started in on the Purples, they not only hunted him down and shot him numerous times, but then ran his lifeless body over with their car, a crime nobody was ever convicted of. 
The Jewish gangster is usually thought of as two distinct personality types, the brutal and the genius. One of the most brutally violent was Bugsy Siegel. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel started out on the streets of New York, extorting money from pushcart operators. Then he fell in with the brilliant Jewish gangster Meyer Lansky. Together with backing from Arnold Rothstein, a Jewish venture capitalist who put his money into illegal enterprises, they became involved with gambling and car theft. In 1930, Siegel and Lansky joined up with Charles Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, who would eventually become godfathers of the Genovese crime family. Along with Luciano, Siegel and Lansky would form Murder Incorporated, the Mafia's notorious murder-for-hire group. Reputedly, Siegel was the one who organized the hit on fellow Jewish mobster Dutch Schultz, after Schultz threatened to assassinate New York prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey. More about Jewish gangster Dutch Schultz later. Then in 1937, Lansky sent Siegel to Los Angeles to organize gambling on the West Coast. There, Siegel recruited fellow Jewish mobster Mickey Cohen, and the two of them established the mob's gambling empire in L.A. They also used Siegel's friendship with actor George Raft to gain entry into Hollywood's upper echelons and extort the movie studios. Siegel's most brilliant plan, however, was to reinvent himself as a legitimate casino operator in Nevada's Las Vegas. Siegel went all out on the construction of the Flamingo Hotel and Casino. It was supposed to be the flagship of what Siegel envisioned as a gambling empire. But cost overruns, problems with financing, and the fact that the Flamingo did not show a profit led Siegel's mafia backers to order Siegel to be hit. Meyer Lansky tried to save his friend, but other mafia leaders did not yield. On the night of June 20th, 1947, as Siegel sat in his mistress's Beverly Hills home, an unknown gunman shot him. Siegel's vision for Las Vegas as the gambling center of North America eventually came true, but not in time to save his life. As I looked at these faces, I felt as though the job I had taken on was a sentence for life. Here we see that Al Capone has sent over Killer Burke to work with the Purples. The price, a cold, deadly murder machine. His name, Killer Burke. So I, uh, I was on my way to Chicago when I heard about the gravy train you boys got in Detroit, and uh, I figured to get on board. So I, uh, I made a little detour. Some detour, Heidi. I thought maybe we could do a little business. You got a load of liquor going to shy. I, I thought maybe you need a good chopper. With the motion picture production code dead and indie films on the rise, filmmakers began using real life mobsters in their stories. Mobsters like Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel, Al Capone, and many more would have movies made about their lives. Now, what did you come here for, killer? You boys got me all wrong. I'm not trying to muscle in. I'm a big time operator just looking for work. Didn't you check me? When I phoned you yesterday, I told you to contact Big Al. We heard you. This is a direct wire to Miami. In one second, Al Capone will be on the other end. And if you're not like this with Scarface, well, we got a few professionals here, too. Hello, boss. You didn't tell me this was a zoo up here. 
Yeah, gorillas. This guy level, Al? Yeah, he's my boy. I want you should lose him up there for a while. He done me a nice job. Okay, Al. How's everything down there? How's the weather? Sunny. Yeah, it's sunny here too, Al. Yeah, bye-bye. Well, boys, now that my references was okay... Yeah, you're okay, Burke. You understand. We can't be too careful. Well, uh, no harm done. But you boys were asleep in this town at that. How do you mean that, Burke? There's big business going on. The boys are here from St. Louis. Forget it. No outside bunch will ever get started in Detroit. We use our brains here, not just blubbering guts like in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Well, without a crystal ball, I predict that's going to be a big-time snatch. Trieg and Rats are in here. I met them in St. Louis. Who were they after? I didn't get no name. <clears throat> they offered me a job. It's out of my line. I'm just giving you boys the dope. All I know is, it's a big-time gambler. The resignation today of New York Mayor Jimmy Walker has ended the inquiry into the conduct of his office for New York Governor. After proving their ability in one kidnapping, the St. Louis visitors try to muscle in on the Olsen brothers' territory. Then Honeyboy and his staff set a trap for the Egan rats, baiting it with an invitation to join the football gang. Hey, where are they? You got a tie to a tree someplace? I invited them up here. Here? Why here? Hey, you want a slug? Sure, go ahead. No liquor. What? What's with that? No liquor, no junk, and no broads when I'm running this show. Now, what's the play, honey boy? Come on. Three mugs that snatched Schofield are on their way up here. Your brother Eddie offered him a piece of the gang. A piece of the purples? Yeah. Now, if that ain't a laugh, huh? <laughs> They're from St. Louis, like Burke said. They're on their way up here to talk a deal. They want to set up a kidnapping racket. Kidnap one gambler a week. In St. Louis, they call them Egan's Rats. Too bad they didn't bring Egan with them. Whoever he is. Let's go. Let's catch him outside. Get on the fire door, Al. Right. Where are they? Easy, killer. They'll be on time. Why don't we meet them outdoors? I hired this place for a clean job, a clean getaway, and no traces. That's the way we work. Sounds all right. These boys got a sense of humor. Yeah, they do. This massacre was based on a real event, the Miraflores Massacre. 
This killing marks the first time a machine gun was used in a homicide in Detroit. Could identify them if they would. The Purples brought in three hired assassins to revenge a double cross. These were dangerous times. The murders took place in apartments rented by Purple members Eddie Fletcher and Abe Axler, which of course made them suspects in the massacre. Hank Smith, born Detroit, product of Hastings Street. Reform school conviction, parole, petty theft, store boost, a mugger, no adult convictions, known hoodlum. Could have been at the Miller Flores apartments. Anyone finger him? If any one of you can identify these men, it's your civic duty to speak up. of the Olsen brothers. Known hoodlum, liquor, gambling, rackets, protection. You ever been in the Miraflores flats, Al? I, uh, was born there. Thomas Allen Burke. Step up, Burke. Thomas Allen Burke, alias Killer Burke, believed to be a hired killer. Believed to have worked in St. Louis, Chicago. No police record. Arrested in Chicago, but not held. You got any friends in Chicago, killer? Chicago? Where's that? But in the end, nobody was ever convicted. The Purples, like Capone in Chicago, had plenty of cops in their pockets. And even the good cops couldn't William get Joseph evidence from Willard. the booze-drinking public. Step forward, Willard. William Joseph Willard, alias Honey Boy Willard. Juvenile conviction, theft, paroled. Turn around, let the audience see your profile. Profile. You've come a long way from Hastings Street, haven't you, Honey Boy? Yeah, Harley. I haven't stopped yet. What became of your old grandparents? They were you should be, copper. Dead. With no evidence, not much hope of getting any, all I could do was harass the gang at every chance and hope for a break. I took out search warrants for the Olsen brothers' offices, although I knew their spies at headquarters had tipped them off the minute the warrant was signed. Their front was solid, and their bookkeeping ingenious. All right, boys. That'll do it. Look, rousting us like this, Inspector, won't do you any good. Here, have a cigar. No, thank you. Won't even touch a cigar. Painted? I don't smoke them. Cops all honest. They found out it pays. Or they know planted money when they see it. How many of these is it going to take, Harley? And how often? I don't smoke those things either. Another honest cop? A wise one, rather. <laughs> okay, let's level. Harley, I want to buy you. Leave town, take a trip, live like a king, anywhere. Eddie, I'm out to bust your rackets and tie up most of the purples you've been using for the rough stuff. So we can't deal, huh? Mm-mm. 
There's more than one way to roast a weenie. You and a million like it there and touch a police when you can't buy. Your friend in Chicago found that out long since. Okay, Inspector. We keep our killings among ourselves. That makes you cops happy. You're wrong. The more gang killings, the stronger one mob gets. It's the public that suffers. Public? Yeah, the public. Look, Holly, we do a public good. Nobody wants this Volstead Act. We supply liquor, good liquor, to over half the country. Okay, Eddie, you keep up the bluff. But I'm telling you, I'll raid every gambling joint, bust every slot machine, clean out every house, and jail your girls beginning right now. Search warrants too, Holly. Remember, the Constitution of the USA. You throw the Constitution at me. I'll get those search warrants. In spite of the bail bondsmen and the crooked clerks you keep around the courthouse to tip you off. I'm out to bust you, Eddie. Wide open. Plow the pieces under. Only an honest cop could talk like that. What are you going to do, Eddie? I could run the liquor business anywhere. Podunk, Iowa, if I have to. The organization is set up, salesmen are out. Tom has all the figures in his head. <laughs> he invented the double bookkeeping system. Okay, Eddie. You take the liquor. I'll keep the city. Which way are you going, Al? Hold it, Al. Blood's thicker than that milk that Honey Boy drinks. Well, I'm going where the action is. You muscling in, Honey Boy, huh? The trucking, the shipments to Chicago, Kansas City, even that lousy Omaha deal. Anything that comes through the tunnel or over the river is yours. Keep it. Run it from Council Bluffs, Iowa, for all I care. Do I hire your boys to protect the trucks? You hire nothing. Run your own business. You got half the prohibition agents on the payroll now. All you need is protection from hijackers. Get your big fat friend in Chicago to set that up for you. Wow, aren't you feeling big? Yeah. We're going all out for straight shakedowns. Gambling. I got an idea for a big one, Eddie. A real big one. Protection racket. You got it on me, boy. It's all yours. Tom and I will operate from out of town. Stick around for a while if you want to watch some changes. Honey Boy takes over the Detroit Rockets from the Olsen brothers, his mentors, who are scared that Detective Hawley will eventually take them down. Honey Boy is not scared of the detective. He's going to beat Harley by using brains and psychology. Yeah, I'd like to see you try to skin that one. I will, Eddie. With brains. You say you can't touch him? I'll tell you how you touch him. You find his weakest spot, his rawest nerve. That's what you touch. This isn't 1917 anymore. We're in the 30s, huh, Hank? We go modern. There's a word you probably haven't heard, Eddie. Psychology. I'll spell it for you. The second type of Jewish gangster, the genius, has an uncanny ability with the numbers racket and setting up a business model. Meyer Lansky was the quintessential Jewish mobster. He was a brilliant organizer and businessman who every Italian mafioso listened to. Lucky Luciano considered him his best counselor and never made a move without Lansky's input. Born in Poland in 1902, Lansky emigrated with his family to New York City in 1911. He got his start with the help of Jewish financier Arnold Rothstein. In the 20s, Rothstein was the venture capitalist of crime. According to some, it was Rothstein who took organized crime out of its gang roots and turned it into a well-run corporation. Rothstein was murdered in 1928, supposedly on orders by another famous Jewish mobster, Dutch Schultz. 
Schultz controlled a sizable bootlegging territory in New York City. He would later be gunned down by Murder Incorporated, the murder for hire group founded by Lansky and Luciano. In 1928, Meyer Lansky took over Rothstein's position as the most important Jewish mobster in the Mafia. By 1936, Lansky established gambling operations in Florida, New Orleans, and Cuba, where he invested his Mafia cronies' illegal gains in legitimate casinos. Lansky continued as the Mafia's premier financial advisor until his death from lung cancer in 1982. In this scene, we have the Purples going to Detective Harley's house. He has made it his mission to bring down the Purples. They are here to scare the hell out of his wife as a warning. They kept a dog. I had to soothe it. What's the setup? The old lady that stays there went over to her neighbors. And? Yeah, the dame you want is in bed reading. I got the window open a ways, and I open both doors. They're unlocked, the front and the back. Let's do it. Yeah, what if her husband comes home? He, after all, he's the a copper. The minute he leaves the station, there'll be a fast car out here to tip us off. Kill her, take this guy and go around the back. That job in the country after tonight. but they end up killing her. Another woman killed by the violent Purple Gang. But the Purple Gang gave me no peace. In this scene, which artfully uses newsreel footage to give us a feeling of authenticity, we hear that the Purples profit from the laundry unions by extorting money for protection. This is correct. The real-life Purple Gang used arson, stench bombs, murders, and general violence to extort funds. If it's damaged or destroyed, the loss is there. But cleaner stock belongs to the public. Damage it, and he's out of business. Facing ruin or death if they didn't pay, eventual bankruptcy if they did, cleaners from all parts of the city sent their delegates to confer. Each delegate represented from 50 to two or 300 cleaners and dyers, wholesale and retail, from all parts of the state. Like I say. Here we see that representatives from the laundry unions have hired the Chicago Mafia to protect them against the Purples. This has been going on for years. It will never stop. So we can't pay and pay to keep our homes and shops from being bombed and burned up. We either go out of business or we fight. That's right. We use our protection money to buy protection, not to be suckers for a racket. Mr. Arlovsky is right. I say fight fire with fire. So 
I have brought Mr. Licovetti here with some of his friends from New York. Chicago. Even the words that scare them purples. Chicago, then. I've only got a few words to say, gents. Let the word get around. We're all mafia. This never happened. If anything, other mobsters, especially from New York, were brought in as muscle to help with the extortion. In 1927, Purple Gang members Eddie Fletcher, Abe Bernstein, Abe Axler, Harry Keywell, and Irving Milberg were charged with conspiring to extort money from the laundry businesses, but beat the charges. The Purple Gang's take from all sources exceeded one million dollars. This golden magnet attracted the racketeers and the big shots. It also drew to its ranks the underworld scum of a dozen cities. Prostitutes, panderers, hopheads. As fast as we brought them in, others took their places. Like many cities in America then and now, Detroit was a sick town. The people were apathetic. Civic duty had become a comic phrase. So had patriotism, honor, all the other words that once stirred decent men to crusade on the side of the law. After Prohibition ended in 1933, the Mafia had to find other illegal enterprises to make money. Organizing gambling had always been a big part of the Jewish Mafia's revenue. But in 1933, American business was also facing the era of unions. Many Jewish immigrants had embraced the Union cause at the beginning of the 20th century as a way to better their circumstances. In the 30s and 40s, the Jewish mobsters also looked to the unions. New York's garment industry, in particular, was full up with Jewish immigrants working for capitalists. It was easy for the Jewish mafia to make inroads there, Likewise with New York's meatpacking and trucking unions. The money was always in the pension funds. And here, the Jewish mobsters could launder their own illegal gains. The 30s were also a time of great change for the mafia as a whole. Thanks to the efforts of Arnold Rothstein and Maya Lansky, the Mafia changed from the narrow-minded, old-world Sicilian way of doing things to a modernized version. Lansky, in particular through his friend Lucky Luciano, turned the Mafia into a corporation with a board of directors. But Lansky did not sit on the board the way the Sicilian Godfathers did. He kept to the shadows and out of sight. As a result, the FBI had a hard time connecting him to the Mafia or any of its illegal enterprises. Even at his trial for tax evasion, the feds could not present enough evidence to convict him. In the movie, the Sicilian Mafia and the Purples are now at war. Now you remember them. Yeah, sure. The old Sugar House gang. Just kids then. He got sent up over that social worker. Yeah, they got uh, shipped off to school. Yes. We graduated. You got a war on your hands. Mafia. That's why we hired you. Name scare you? Just put us in the way of making a few bucks, honey boy. Atta boy. We got a little job tonight. A place called the Collingwood Manor. Joint's been cased, we know the apartment. There's three, maybe four, the main mafia hold up there. Maybe we could ask them to come over here, talk business like we did before. I don't think the mafia would go for it, killer. We'll figure something out on the way. Better get some of the good stuff, Rico. I'll get it. What do you hear from the Purples? Honey Boy was keeping for the river, mostly. They got a boat. I'd like to torpedo him and his boat. 
knock off the head of the purples and you write your own ticket in this town. All right, let's police up this joint a bit. We got company coming. Dames, that ain't company, that's living. All right, let's get rid of some of these flower pots. They may start wandering. That guy, who's he? Just a juice head. Don't be so sure he slaps his feet down like a harness bull. Drive by him once slow and then turn around and pull up in front of the calling. Well, what do you think? He's just a panhandler. Come on, let's get this job done and get ready. I got a good look at the man sitting next to the driver. Where are you calling from? The Collingwood Manor. Now, that's all I can tell you. I just got on the case an hour ago. Good work, Mac. We'll be right over. So everything we've got around that block. Dames, let him in. Yes, sir. The Purples kill off the head of the Mafia, and Detective Harley brings down the Purple Gang. He sums it up 
blaming Honey Boy's ways on his emotional trouble, on his psychology. Here, Blake is at his best, showing he is crazy. I want to go in here. Let me... Let me out. He would bring that character back to the big screen as the psychopathic killer in In Cold Blood. Then, 40 years later, he would be tried for the same type of crime in real life. Since the end of The Purples, only the times have changed. The daily headlines remain the same. Yet any intelligent adult could pick out any youngster earmarked for emotional troubles. The signs are plain. But only the civic awareness of the American public can bring an end to Rat Pack terrorism. In reality, the Purple Gang came to an end because of a combination of infighting and outside mobsters. The district attorney couldn't let the bloodshed go on and cracked down on them hard. This left an opening for Vicentio Licavoli. Like in the movie, mobsters from St. Louis came to Detroit. Unlike in the movie, they take over. James Licavoli was born Vicentio Licavoli in Sicily. He emigrated to the United States with his parents and eventually settled in St. Louis along with other members of their family. In St. Louis, he became a bootlegger. Later, Licavoli went to his cousins to Detroit where they wrested control of the city's rackets from the Purple Gang. While in Detroit, he was also convicted of bootlegging and served a stint in Leavenworth. Abe Bernstein and the Purples ruled Detroit from 1927 to 1932, before jealousies and intergang warfare destroyed them. But Bernstein would reinvent himself later joining Meyer Lansky and Joe Adonis to run gambling casinos in Miami, Florida until his death on March 7, 1968. By the 1980s, Hollywood was no longer fearful of putting Jewish mobsters on the big screen. Meyer Lansky was portrayed in 10 movies alone. As for the Jewish mafia, which would later become known as the Kosher Nostra, not one of the famous Jewish mobsters, not Bugsy Siegel, nor Lansky, nor Duck Schultz, founded a crime family. Only the Detroit Purples did. In the end, Jewish mobsters went legit and quietly buried their gangster past. Or so they would have us believe. I'm sorry, but no comment. Well, you can't blame me for asking, can you? No, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs>